I'm European champion, so I'm not one of of the bottle. I must. I think I'm a special one. The greatest coaches and their greatest 11s. In today's edition, Jose Mourinho. Formation-wise, we will go with a 4-3-3, 4-2-3-1 hybrid. Two formations which Mourinho was heavily associated with during his prime. Without further ado, let's take a look at the selection for the goalkeeper position. Now, just focusing in on Cesar first, his performances in Serie A, he was an ever-present. He kept 17 clean sheets which earned him the Serie A goalkeeper of the year award for the second consecutive year becoming only the third goalkeeper to win it more than once and for his performances in the Champions League he won the UEFA club goalkeeper of the year who can forget that save against Lionel Messi in the semi-finals he was also vital in the team's Coppa Italia campaign where he kept two clean sheets in the semi-final tie against Fiorentina and just going back to the Champions League, aside from that performance against Barca, he also put in a great display against Bayern Munich, making vital saves against Thomas Muller and Iron Robin. Now moving on to Petr Cech. Well, Petr Cech pre-injury was the best keeper that the Premier League had seen since Peter Schmeichel. And quite frankly, at that stage, he looked destined to even surpass the Great Dane. He set a new Premier League record of 1,025 minutes without letting in a goal. And he was also awarded the Premier League Golden Glove at the end of the 2004 or 5 season for keeping a record 21 clean sheets in the Premier League. Now, Chelsea went on to retain the league the following season. Again, Czech played a huge part in that. He conceded just 22 goals. And in January 2006, he was named the world's best keeper for 2005. So for me, it's a tight call between Julio Cesar and Petr Cech. Cesar is so underrated and he was a pivotal figure in Inter's treble, a fantastic shot stopper. But for me, Czech was a player who looked like he could be a GOAT in goalkeeping circles, someone that could compete with the likes of Neuer, Buffon. That's how good he looked pre-injury. And he had a more complete game. He was someone who, you know, he could come and collect crosses. Um, his distribution was solid, great one-on-one. -on -one. He was a very complete keeper, so for me, he edges it. Moving on to the right-back position, Paolo Ferreira. He started off as a right midfielder for Porto and then was quickly converted into a right-back where he made his name. Nippy, strong in the tackle, good balance to his game. He's reminiscent of players like Gary Neville, efficient in possession, good crosser, good at ball retention and positionally very sound. Maicon, on the other hand, was less of a steady presence. He was more of a genuine tactical weapon who could own a flank by himself. He was named 2009 and 10 UEFA Club Defender of the Year and he earned a nomination for the Ballon d'Or. So for a team that will lack natural width from either flank and is generally going to be a steady defensive unit, I think Maicon is the player to pick here. He's a breath of fresh air. And for me, he hit a level during that treble season that Ferreira would struggle to match. Central defenders. Now, for me, Carvalho has to be a shoe. Jose took him wherever he went. He was a colossus for Porto. Chelsea, I call him the Portuguese Nesta because he's one of the most underrated centre-backs of all time. Blessed with pace, judgment, tenacity and comfortable on the ball too. Now, if we look at the other contenders we've got Walter Samuel um, an injury prone player who finally got it together under Jose and was a powerhouse during that Champions League run Lucio an icon at Leverkusen and for Brazil the horse the guy who could gallop through the <laughs> from defense all the way into the heart of the opposition defense he kept Drogba quiet during the Chelsea interclash during the treble season and frustrated the Ivorian to the point where he got himself sent off and finally we have John Terry, one of the most underrated centre-backs in English football history. Blessed with two great feet, wonderful aerial ability and voted player of the year. Best defender for the Champions League season during Jose's debut season as Chelsea manager. And also voted as member of the World Eleven at the FIFA Pro Awards. For me, it's between Lucio and John Terry. If it was based on just sheer 
ability over the course of their career, I'd go with Lucio. But if you're basing it on their level of performance under Mourinho, for me, John Terry, the young John Terry before his back injuries was a phenomenal defender. And I think Jose and him had such a special connection. He'd have to be the captain of Jose Mourinho's team. So I'm going with the Englishman. Looking at left back, for me, Ashley Cole didn't play long enough for Mourinho to merit inclusion, nor did he win enough under Mourinho. Instead, it was William Galas who was Chelsea's main left back during Mourinho's first two years at Chelsea. He hated playing there, but his pace, aggression, astute use of the ball made him a nightmare to play against and a pivotal figure for why Chelsea's defence was so watertight between 2004 to 2006. At Inter, Jose would rotate between Zanetti and Kivu at left back. But that's no slight on Zanetti. It's just he trusted Zanetti so much he would use him in midfield sometimes to plug gaps. And whenever there was tactical adjustments to be made in the game, he would rely on Zanetti to be that man. For me, Zanetti, absolute legend of the game and one of the finest flank defenders of all time. So for me, he gets the nod here because Galas, as good as he was under Jose, doesn't bring that same level of class, versatility or leadership that Zanetti would be able to bring to the table. In defensive midfield, we have a very tight call to make. Now, some would argue that we should play Makaleli and Cambiasso as a double pivot. Now, Cambiasso was arguably the heartbeat of Inter's treble campaign and had more attacking responsibility than Makaleli. But as good as he was, he didn't redefine the holding role like Makaleli did. Someone who was sorely, sorely missed by the Galacticos of Real Madrid. And then when he came into English football, he took it by storm. They renamed the position the Makaleli position. Furthermore, I felt Makaleli had to basically dominate a midfield in which he wasn't really surrounded by any other playmakers. So he was burdened with a lot of work from a DLP perspective. And nothing illustrates this more than that famous performance against Fulham where they ended up man-marking Makaleli and Chelsea couldn't even play properly. So defensively, a superior player to Cambiasso and based on what this side needs to remain balanced, I'm going with Makaleli. Now typically you'd probably expect Mourinho to go with a box-to-box midfielder here. And there was no better box-to-box midfielder who fitted the Mourinho system than a prime Michael Essien, an absolute powerhouse who could eat up ground and who could forget the quality of his goals in big games. But having said that, he only really played for Jose properly in his prime for two seasons. And, you know, the main season in which he won the league was the 05-06 season. And you could argue that that was a season where he was still to some extent finding his feet. Now, if we're going for a more stylish option, you've got Jabi Alonso, who rather like Cambiasso straddled between CDM, CM. He was already making his presence felt at Madrid before Mourinho had arrived. You know, he was already being seen as part of the La Liga team of the season. You know, Real Madrid fans gave him a new nickname, the Red Beard. Uh, And it's worth noting that in order for Alonso to be functional, he also needed legs around him. So in an ideal world, he would probably be paired up with an Essien. Now, due to the competition in the attacking midfield position and the fact that, in my opinion, Lampard would operate deeper than a traditional number 10 and he was much more hardworking in the defensive phase than people give him credit for, I've put him into the central midfielder category. Now, one of the criticisms of the younger Lampard was that he was not involved in the heavy lifting of running or dictating midfield play. He was someone who more focused on getting into the box and making late runs. However, I would argue that whilst if this was Ancelotti's 11, you'd need a regista type midfielder to run the midfield. But Mourinho never really had that type of midfielder apart from Jabi Alonso or maybe Stankovic. So for me, I think we can get away with picking Lampard here because the defence looks solid anyway. And his role here would just be very efficient, get the ball up the pitch and then join in with the attack. A great Jose team tends to have an old school number 10. Now, the first option is Messi Ozo, the playmaking linchpin of the title-winning side in Spain, you know, regularly topping the assist charts across Europe. 
and probably in his prime as a player. So fun to watch. Before Ozil, Jose had rejuvenated the career of Wesley Schneider. Now, after being plagued with injury at Madrid and looking at his depth, Schneider settled into the more sedate pace of Serie A where he could let his football brain do the talking. And as he grew in confidence, he was able to replicate the form that he was beginning to show for Holland, which we saw glimpses of in Euro 2008. And he became the heartbeat of Inter's attack during the treble season. Blessed with two feet, he could strike from 30 yards off either foot. He could switch the play 40 to 50 yards with either foot. He was a set-piece maestro as well as being a playmaker. Almost the complete number 10. Before Schneider, we had Mourinho's original number 10, Deco, key figure during the UEFA Cup winning and league winning campaign in 2002-03, follows it up by dominating Europe during the 2004 Champions League campaign, scoring the second goal of the match in the final. You know, he was the Champions League's top assist provider and he also won the UEFA Club Footballer of the Year. For me, it's a tough call between Deco and Schneider, but I'm going to give it to Schneider. I think, especially if we're going with Lampard, we're going to need more legs in that midfield. And Schneider would come very deep to dictate the play. He was very action-packed. Uh, and for me, this team needs that engine that Schneider can provide in his prime. Moving on to the right wing, you couldn't get two more different choices. You've got Iron Robin, a player who was at the beginning of his career, super exciting, born to play on the wing, but very injury prone, a source of frustration for Mourinho, but nevertheless, a pivotal figure uh, whilst Chelsea won two back-to-back titles. If we're being fussy, we could argue that he played the second season more on the left wing. Eto, someone who was disastrously discarded by Barcelona at the time, arguably the world's leading centre forward. And yet, when he came to Inter, Mourinho decided to convince him and convert him into a right-sided midfielder and someone who had to work very hard tracking back. And fair play to Eto, it showed that he was tactically very versatile and happy to sacrifice his game for the greater good. And what a job he did. Famously in that Barcelona semi-final, he, he almost played right back. It was reminiscent of Gerrard's performance against AC Milan in the Istanbul final. You know, into it down to 10 men and he tracked back. He did everything he could for that team. For his performances that season, I think that surpasses anything any other right winger was capable of under Mourinho. So it has to be Eto who gets the edge here. Moving on to the left wing, we're a bit spoilt for choice. Starting off with Cristiano Ronaldo, 60 goals in 55 games. La Liga winner, absolutely phenomenal. Arguably should have won the Ballon d'Or, you know, he finished second to Lionel Messi, who was in his prime as well. So nothing to, be, you know, nothing to be sniffed at. At this stage of his career, his goal scoring was at its zenith. He still had the dribbling. He still had the flair. I wouldn't say his running ability was as fluid as during his time at United, but as an overall package, this was Cristiano Ronaldo at his best. Hazard also very nimble, very agile. But his goal scoring numbers didn't quite come close. Um, but his big match performances were impressive. But for me, it has to be Cristiano, no doubt. Up front, we have contenders such as Diego Costa. And for me, Diego Costa was a huge component in Chelsea's rise from the ashes. And he was someone who was a nightmare to play against. Very physical opponent. Reminds me a bit of Luis Diaz, the energy and the presence that he's bringing to Liverpool right now, but in the form of a striker. But as good as he was, it's not as good as Diego Melito during that Inter treble winning season. He was so difficult to play against. He was instrumental. You know, he scored a goal in Inter's victory in the final of the Coppa Italia. He then scores the goal which secures Inter's 18th Scudetto. And then he scores two goals in the Champions League final against Bayern Munich. Just one of the best single seasons for a striker I think I've ever seen. And then you've got Drogba, arguably on paper, the perfect centre forward in a lone forward formation. Fast, strong, aerially dominant, 
able to shoot from distance, able to create for others, brilliant hold-up play. But it's worth noting that in his first few seasons for Chelsea, he was only scoring around 16 goals and there was a lot of talk about whether he was a, a flop or slightly a bit overrated, despite the fact he was a part of a team that had won back-to-back titles. It was the third season under Mourinho where he became this figure of absolute dominance where you know many defenders who were world-class at that time say that Drogba was one of the most difficult opponents they've ever faced, if not the toughest. Highlights that season included that famous turn and volley against Liverpool from way out, uh, that 93rd minute equaliser against Barcelona, the two goals to win the League Cup final against Arsenal, the FA Cup winner against United. Now, whilst they didn't win the league, you know, you couldn't blame Drogba for it because his goal scoring was phenomenal that season. And that's why he ended up being runner-up in the PFA award to Cristiano Ronaldo, which was no mean feat. So do we pick the striker who arguably had one of the best single seasons for a centre-forward of all time? Or a striker who whose overall game was so dominant, despite the fact that he never won the best trophies, defenders at the time said that he's the toughest centre-forward they've ever played against. And for me, that's what edges me towards Drogba, because if you just look at it away from the trophies, just his actual performance, you know, I think he was the archetype or perfect centre-forward in a 4-2-3-1, and that's why I'm going to give it to Didier. So there you have it, Jose Mourinho's greatest eleven. Now, you know, shout outs to Lucio, Cambiaso, Melito, they could easily have got in. It's probably personal preference or, you know, the emotional connection between Mourinho to some of the players I've picked that's edged me towards those players. But you could easily pick the same eleven and put those players in. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please like, share and subscribe and see you guys again next time. Bye.